Most people know NASA for the moon landing, the space shuttle, and sending probes to other bodies. But NASA does much more than that. Out of its nearly $25 billion budget request for 2022, about 10% go to the Earth Science Division. Through various programs like Landsat or MODIS, a wealth of data is collected every day about what is happening down on Earth. These allow to monitor floods, global warming, and storms to just name a few. However, this data is quite complex, both in how it is distributed with the use of APIs and different portals, down to the formats of how this data is created, using things like GeoTIFF, NetCDF, or H5. All of this is important for the accuracy of data, but pauses one big problem. Most people have no idea how to use any of this. Not to mention, there is so much data, it's hard to know where to look at. Over the years, NASA and many other agencies have invested in making more visualizations to showcase what one can see from space and how that relates back to what is happening on Earth. My guest today is Joshua Stevens. So I'm the lead visualizer for NASA's Earth Observatory. Him and his team are behind many of the different visualizations that you might see if you start following around the latest stories shared by NASA Earth. I want to understand a little bit more about the tools, the methods, and the methodologies Joshua and his team are using, but also about the importance of doing such work. So having someone in the middle ground who understands you know, human psychology and how the, the vision system works can help translate those scientific results to a map you know, kindergartners can, can read in their classroom and people can just pick up and see what's going on. And you have you know, satellite data in the hands of millions and millions of people who otherwise wouldn't be able to interpret it. Before we get started, this episode is sponsored by EO Hub, a collaboration between Up42 and GeoAwesomeness. GeoAwesomeness has been a key pillar in the geospatial community for the past 11 years now. I've actually had the founders, Alex and Mutu, on the podcast before. They write articles, host online events, and when possible, organize in-person meetups. They also collect and contribute to podcasts and videos in the geospatial community. The EO Hub is a new section on their website that's dedicated to Earth observation and satellite imagery that they've built in order to showcase how this industry is changing our world. It's supported by Up42, a geospatial marketplace and platform. So if this sounds interesting, I encourage you to go take a look at it at geoawesomeness.com. I'll have a link in the show notes. With all of that said, here's my conversation with Joshua Stevens. All right, Joshua, I'm, I'm pretty excited to finally have you on. This has been a, yeah. a long time coming. <laughs> it certainly has. It's great that we finally make it work out. Um, I, I don't know if you know, I, I like starting these conversations the same way uh, every single time. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. I'm quite curious, how would you describe yourself? That's a good question. I mean, I'm at the broadest sense, just a guy who makes maps but I didn't start necessarily, you know, early in my career with the idea of making maps. And, um, yeah, I just love all things, graphics, maps, communicating things digitally. I'm a big fan of art in general and any time that can intersect with earth science, that's a win for me. So you, you said you were not started with maps. Can we go, let's, let's go at the beginning then. How did things uh, get started? How did you end up, uh, playing with maps? Sure. So, I mean, I think this is one of those things too, that's becoming more frequent is that when I started out in early college, I didn't even know like a professional car cartographer was a thing. Someone could be, you know, studying graphic design and photography at the time. And that, that was a lot of fun, but it also seemed one of those things that I was really indulging in sort of a, a passion that I wasn't sure how to monetize and actually be successful with. And then I uh, ultimately switched my major over to computer science. And that was a whole new challenge, entirely different thing. But one of the projects our professor had us doing was sort of comparing images and seeing similarity between images. And that sort of flipped on a little switch that, hey, you know, maybe there's a route here with graphics and, and programming. And then I, I couldn't tell you exactly how it happened, but mm. I, I saw in one of the, you know, the, the student guidebooks that there's this course on GIS. And I learned about this thing where there's, you know, shapes on maps and you can compute things and do stuff. So I talked to the geography department in my junior year, and then it basically was history from there. I fell in love with maps, and it was a perfect combination of that sort of artistic graphic side and also the programming and computer science. How did you decide to go towards computer science? Because that's like quite a stretch from photography and graphic design. 
Yeah, absolutely. So i am always been kind of curious and technical. You know, when I was a little kid, I was always playing with Linux computers and trying to figure things out, breaking things and see if I could fix them again. So there was a, you know, always sort of a technological itch I needed to scratch. And that was just one of the things I, I chose to pursue and do that. And back then, you know, that was like one of the successful, uh, and it still is to a, to a large degree, um, college degrees. Like if you want right. to have a successful career, computer science is a, is a pretty safe bet. Yeah. You, you, you said like one of the things, like it was interesting to do photography, graphic design, but you were not sure how you were going to monetize that, how to make a, a living. Do you think that would be a bit different today or do you think it's still a bit the case? I, I think it's still a bit the case, especially with photography. I'm friends with a lot of photographers and, you know, it's even the most successful of them. It takes a lot of work, a lot of investment and just it's a big roll of the dice, I think. And again, I'm not a photographer, so, you know, others might feel differently on that, but it's certainly not the security that, you know, I find today or that one might find with computer science. Right. To, so, so let's get a little bit into your, into your current role. Can you, can you sure. elaborate a little bit on what you do today? Sure. So I'm the lead visualizer for NASA's Earth Observatory. And what we do as a group is essentially share all kinds of science that NASA is producing, whether it's a you know, new instrument being built and launched, new science that's been funded, or new publications that others are uh, sort of putting out with NASA data. And we just share the world through the, through the lens of NASA, you know, what's happening if there's a flood over here, or, you know, recently the hurricane, uh, Hurricane Ian and, and Fiona, you know, just sharing natural color imagery, maps and analysis, graphs, charts, all kinds of things, just letting people know what we can actually see from the vantage point of space. So is that, that one of the things I wanted to, to dig a little bit with you is understanding why that is important, why that is something that, that needs to be done. Like NASA is in, in the mind of a lot of people is this institution, which is like the pinnacle of science basically. And so why do we need people like you who can show what we can do? It sounds like a, you know, a pretty trivial question, but still, I'd like to ask it to you. Why is the work that you're doing important? Right. And, and I think there's sort of uh, two angles to that. The first is that we can see so much from space that we couldn't otherwise, you know, do, you know, we can study glaciers in remote areas that people can't get to frequently enough to do the kind of science that's important. We can, you know, monitor wildfires in ways that someone on the ground couldn't do. The other aspect of that is a lot of this very science, very technical, uh, quantitative data isn't necessarily designed for the layperson or the general public to consume. So having someone in the middle ground who understands, you know, human psychology and how the, the vision system works can help translate those scientific results to a map, you know, kindergartners can, can read in their classroom and, and people can just pick up and see what's going on. And you have, you know, satellite data in the hands of millions and millions of people who otherwise wouldn't be able to interpret it. So the first thing I, I think about is if, if we go into like, I, one of the things I like asking a lot on the podcast is about like how, how the money works and so where the money goes and things like that. NASA is a publicly funded uh, organization. And so is, is that, is, do you see that need even more important to like, here's all the things we do and we need to be able to justify it to people. So, so part of that is explaining it to people compared to maybe like what a private company would do where they don't really need kindergarten kids to understand what they're doing. I, I'd like to explore that a little bit more. Sure. I mean, in some regards, no, because one of the things, you know, NASA is doing is they put out this data for anyone to use. Right. So necessarily, you know, the map might not be the end product that's designed when a mission, you know, is funded and, and scheduled out, but it's certainly one of those things. It's a societal good. You know, a lot of private companies will do things, but they do it because they want to make money. We mm -hmm. do it because we want people to learn about what's happening, you know, in the world that they live in and with also a, you know, a sidebar there, this is how you can actually you know, learn about things visually. This is how you can see, you know, things that you didn't know you could see, you know, thermal hot spots and wind patterns and things like that. We have a, you know, an, an ethical or, or a you right. know, societal good in mind that goes beyond just making money or, or making good on the money that uh, is put into put in. Do you hear back from people who are like, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize this is all the 
the stuff that we could do with it or or even from you know younger kids kindergarten we were talking about that yeah all the time our group receives you know dozens and dozens of emails every single day it's either people thanking us you know for something that they put out sometimes it's people making requests you know oh i flew over this area and i saw this really neat thing do you have any imagery of this can you make one and you know we get a lot of feedback and that's great to hear i can imagine yeah that's probably one of the cool things is that you have that link with people compared to sometimes you put stuff out you don't really know what what people think of it that that sounds like amazing but also maybe a little bit overwhelming to have like dozens per day yeah i mean our, our email system is pretty well triaged so Fair it's enough. like everybody isn't getting bombarded with everything all at once which is a real blessing did you did you like when you were I, I'm i'm still trying to understand a little bit like how you got into this did you have any did you ever see like examples of of maps when you were lo- younger or, or like people who were doing this with with data because we've had programs like landsat for you know a long time now uh of that did was there anything that you saw that you thought wow this is this is something that's really cool i'd like to go do that no it's kind of like the weirdest thing like I can't even think of maps like before I started studying them, like, look, you know, you hear stories with little kids, they love pirate maps. I didn't even think of maps growing up. Like I thought maps were like, maybe just this thing that just existed, just as books in the library did, you know, you don't as a child really think of how they come to be. And then I don't know, maybe, maybe that's sort of like a, a weird part of my childhood where I just didn't even imagine maps until I was much older. But do you think that's like helpful in, in today, how you're doing your job? Because one of the things I want to talk about a little bit later is how you're thinking about design. Like that's, that's a really big part of what you're doing and how to convey information. Do you think not having this, this bias, for example, of like having seen all of that, but coming from more graphic design photography and then applying it to scientific data and to maps is helpful. I think it's very helpful. And I think it's helpful, you know, for, others who ne- don't necessarily have like a photographic or a design background, but just come from any, you know, outside sort of discipline to bring new perspectives. Cause it's, it is one of those disciplines where it was previously only scientists, scientists and engineers sort of making contributions. And now, you know, 15 years ago when I was teaching the cartography labs at Michigan state, we'd get a lot of uh, students from like communications backgrounds and people who wanted to do like, I don't know, just, just really cool art. But, you know, they, they didn't have the geographic background. So they're bringing something new, like, well, why can't I do it this way? Like, this is what I want this thing to look like. And, you know, that's very, very helpful in a lot of ways. And then five years later, when I was teaching the same kind of cartography labs at Penn State, there was a different sort of draw from students. They had a different relationship with the IST, the, the information technology students. And they had this whole other, you know, desire to do things with data that wasn't necessarily artistic, but they had these you know, goals with apps they were thinking about building and and translating data in new ways. And just anytime somebody can think about data in a way that it's not traditionally been thought of or not conventionally thought of, that's always very helpful. So how do you guys bring the two together? Because there's a lot of data processing that happens. Like before you get, you you can make a visualization, you have, I'm guessing you have something in mind, you want to do that and you need to process it to get there, but then you need to make it artistic. So it feels like it's a, a balance between like the engineering computer science side and, and and then the artistic how do you bring those two things together which i think maybe don't usually go together sure i, I think a lot of it comes you know in some degree from experience and I, I don't necessarily mean like the experience of just writing the code to make the thing but knowing that sometimes the best design is you know the simplest thing so there's a lot of really clever creative sort of um bespoke art that can be made from be made from data but when you're trying to communicate a complex topic to millions of people sometimes those really creative things aren't necessarily the the best thing you know so the data processing isn't necessarily going from you know something totally scientific to totally original but keeping it somewhat similar you know if it's map data we're probably going to make a map out of it rather than try to turn it into like some spiral chart you know that people can't understand and that sort of thing. But, you know, that's where in my particular experience, it has been helpful to, to have those computer science classes 
where I can translate data from various formats into something that is in the shape or form that I want it in to do something in GIS or apply colors or, or do something in other software that maybe GIS software or scientific software isn't best suited for. How do you decide which direction to, to go on? Where, you mentioned like recently there's been a lot of storms. Um, I think Ian, I'm sorry, I haven't really been paying that much attention, but so there's these really big storms that are, that are happening. So there's a lot of things to, to talk about on those. How do you decide what angle you're, you're going to go for? What story you're going to tell, what designs you're going to make? Sure. A lot of that comes from just the fact that we're a team, we're, we're a large group and we have, you know, a lot of relationships with other groups, whether it's disasters, groups, satellite teams, and it often comes down to what we can see. So depending on the, the mission or the, the phenomena that's happening, what can we see? What we can we say about that? That's really important and helpful to people to understand the situation. And then there's another angle where people are actually using the data on the ground to assess situations sometimes. So that's a, another thing that can factor in there. If we can produce something that, you know, informs, helps, and just pushes the, uh, the knowledge about the situation further. I mean, it's, you know, often we will share, you know, a natural color image of a hurricane or storm, but that's like the, the bare minimum. You know, we always want to go further than that. Say, what does this mean? What is the, you know, the actual result of this? What do we learn about this? What are okay. scientists say? saying about this particular data. So let's go on the storm. Do you have a little bit of examples of like what that might look like to just, just also to try to get myself, maybe people listening a little bit of a better understanding of what that can look like? Sure. Um, a great impact of that, you know, with, with hurricanes that came through, especially recently is Puerto Rico, where there's a lot of power outages due to the storms and things like that. And of course, power out, uh, power companies, they track that information They're you know, they know who their customers are. But that data isn't always, um, you know, as granular um, as we might want it to be, especially in rural rural areas. So, using nighttime lights, we can see where these power outages are happening, and and see, you know, a, a, a wider expanse of that than es simply estimates from power companies. We know which areas are are out, which areas are being served, where sort of um, rebuilding efforts take place, and where they're not taking place, and that can contribute to conversations about all kinds of things um, related to disaster recovery. Okay, I understand. So you get nighttime imagery and at night, if you don't have power, don't have lights, so you can see that and then you turn that into a, a map or a graphic or something like that. Does that summarize? Right? Yeah, absolutely. So we can show like, this is what it looked like before where all the lights were on. Right. This is what it looks like afterwards. And here you can see some lights are still on, but these areas don't have any lights. Who lives in this area? You know why? You know why are their lights still out? And especially when Hurricane Maria happened years ago, we can see that there are some areas where the lights remained out. You know, well right. after the storm. So then that contributes to a different discussion about you know how relief funds and, and effort are being distributed into which communities. And so back to my question, like, how do you decide that's the the story in a way that you're going to tell? Is it because You've, you've heard somewhere else that, oh, there is this power outage. Let's go, there, there's, there's probably a power outage here. Let's go take a look at the nighttime imagery. And you, you have, the way I'm thinking about it is, do you have like all these pipes of data and then you, you get an idea of like, this is, there might be something happening. You have this experience of like, this is the best data that would help us see it. How, how does that process happen? Sure. So it's kind of multifaceted in the sense that when a particular event happens at a particular place, we have past experience with these types of events, whether it's floods or storms or anything, we know, okay, we might want to look at data X, Y, and Z, you know, for floods, we might be looking at MODIS data to see differences where there is water now and water, you know, wasn't before. Um, if it's storms, we might look at wind patterns or, you know, just the cloud structures, rainfall and things like that. We also have teams, you know, not within our group, but within the agency and agency partners who monitor specific instruments and they're doing specific science, like the Black Marble team, for instance, they produce very high detailed, high resolution graph graphics and, and analysis of night lights. So taking data that is conventionally at seven, uh, 750 meters per pixel down to 30 meters per pixel. So we can see changes in night lights at the neighborhood level. 
So those teams are always on the eye for anything that might affect power outages for any reason across the world. And in an event like a hurricane, they're going to be like, you know, the, the first group that's really looking into this. And they'll either reach out to us and say, hey, we've got this analysis. You know, would you like to, you know, put a story together? Right. Or, you know, that's also a team we know who does this. So whenever there's an event coming up, we might say, hey, you know, is your team looking at this? Do you have anything that you might share with us? Right. So it seems like there's a lot of people who are working with a lot of different data sources to try to put that together and see what can be told with it on a continuous basis. Yeah, absolutely. And that's just one of so many dozens of examples of different phenomena in different regions where, you know, these things happen across the, the board at, at a very large scale. So let's stay on this example of, of the power outage. You, there's the, the night data, we can see that there was a power outage, we can see track it through time. What happens with those visualization with that story, you, you put it out? Um, who does that? Who consumes that? Is it the general public? You were saying there's like people on the ground, like, what are the different branches of, of how this information gets used? Yeah, and, and that could go any way. It really depends on the story. So we'll, okay. we'll put out the story, you know, with, with the facts, with information, with other reporting from other sources, and then how that's used by readers. You know, it could go any way, you know, who knows, you know, out of the millions of readers, what somebody is going to gain from it. Um, you know, there's been instances where we put out something, hey, this is a really, you know, dramatic image of a flood. And we just put it out, you know, it's for anybody to use. And then months later, we get a, you know, an email from somebody at FEMA, hey, do you have this data, we're actually putting this thing together for, you know, response scenarios in the future. You know, and it's just, you never know how someone is going to see something make use of it or get ideas for how they might make use of it in the future. Can you just elaborate uh, what FEMA is, please? Sure. So FEMA is a federal, uh, basically emergency management agency within the United States. So whenever there's a disaster or floods, things like that, they're the first to sort of set up a command center and start assessing the situation and responding to that at the, the local area of need. Right. Thanks. Did you work with, um, bodies like FEMA, um, directly, or is it always through, you put something out in, in the press, like publicly, and then they reach out or, or do you have like more internal structures? There, there's not a, uh, like a firm internal structure for that. It's okay. oftentimes very serendipitous. You know, we'll sometimes get requests, you know, people who have seen our stories or have worked with us in the past might request a particular image or a particular thing. Um, but oftentimes it's just what we put out to the public. That's the same thing that the, the agencies, um, or other groups would make make use of. One thing our group doesn't do is exclusives. So sometimes we might get a request from people in the media asking for an image for this because they have a, you know, their news TV show is coming up and they want this image for this thing. We don't share that with the media unless we're putting it out also for the public. So mm -hmm. if we've got something already in the, the works, sure, we'll share it with the media, but we're not going to make something specific for this media group that other people aren't going to have access to. Right. That's a something I never thought about, but that makes a lot of sense. I'm guessing it's also because the data is free and open anyways. Yeah, the data is free and open and, and it just goes back to our desire to put out things that's for the public good and not simply for, you know, individuals mm -hmm. or companies to make some kind of gain from. So what's the relationship with, with media and journalism as well? Like that, that I think that's a, a pretty big portion. I'd like to open up on that. Sure. It's very, I would describe it as very collegial, very collaborative. I mean, I've had the personal benefit of knowing uh, many other journalists and various newsrooms uh, across the world even. And, you know, we, we share tips. We, we all follow the same conferences, the same sort of articles to, you know, see what others are making, what kind of maps they're making. Um, one thing we do within our group is anytime we publish like high res image imagery, we also share a very high res version of that that doesn't have labels or our mm. own individual annotations on it. And that's specifically for those newsrooms and others who want to make use of that imagery and their own publications. What, what does that collaboration look like? Is it, you, you mentioned like some media outlets come towards you. Do you reach out to some of them about like, Hey, we found something really interesting. You might want to pay attention to this. There might be a story here that you might want to tell as well. 
So it's more of the lines like, you know, we often like take the Washington Post, for example, we'll, we'll cite them in our articles. They're often covering the same sort of things when it comes to climate. Um, there's been cases when, where folks have asked us, hey, we saw this map that you put out or the story. Where can I find this data for that? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we, we point them to the links and maybe the documentation that explains how to read it. Sometimes they've asked, do you have this map, you know, for us? And then what we'll do is, we'll, you know, like I said, we share the, the imagery without labels and things so that everyone can use. But if anytime someone makes a request that might be different from that, maybe they want a GeoTIFF rather than simply a JPEG, we then update our article so that the public has access to that GeoTIFF right. and then let the journalist know, hey, this link is now active. So it's never a, a custom work for one individual. It's always, if that works has to be done, it has to go out in the open, even if it's after the fact. Yeah. Huh, that's pretty interesting. Like, I come mostly from the private sector, so this kind of blows my mind. But it's pretty cool. It makes a lot of sense. Do you have uh, maybe examples of moments where, um, like, it has been a little bit more difficult to work with the uh, with the media, like, because there, like, a lot of the the job of journalism is also to tell a story. So where you don't have the, the the data for example to to tell that story like i'm i'm curious how the interaction between the work that you're doing where you're it's i'm guessing from what i understand it's it's the data first and then what can we tell from it and the journalism is maybe a little bit the other way around where it's the story and then we're going to go see how we can what we can use to 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 tell that story yeah, so we, we certainly have some challenges in that regard of sometimes not necessarily having the data or the analysis that we want to tell a particular story. Often those challenges come um, from like research groups and, you know, mm. PIs who are leading a study, not necessarily the media itself. Okay. Um, you know, there are sometimes groups who are happy to share data, but they want you to use exactly this color palette, you know, and, and that's something, you know, we just don't. I don't know, we, we don't pay too much attention to that sort of thing because, you know, one of the key goals of the Earth, Earth Observatory is just as we make that data and those graphics open for everyone, we also have a very particular approach to color, making sure things are accessible, making sure things are, you know, considering, you know, color blindness and other issues. So we don't let outside groups decide how we're going to put out a particular map or which colors we're going to use. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Do you have like, again, I, I, I like examples. Do you have examples of maybe some of the designs that, that are thoughtful in that way? Like colorblindness is a very good example. Yeah, colorblindness is a great example. About 10% uh, of men have a form of red-green colorblindness. So they're unable to sort of, you know, differentiate those two colors. And, you know, that's a, that's a sizable that's number a lot of people. people. You've got millions of readers. So, you know... Anytime you're making, you know, graphics about, you know, dryness and wetness is, is one where a lot of groups like to use red and green, you know, because, you know, they, they make a lot of sense, you know, red areas might be dry and green areas are wet. But if 10% of your readers aren't going to be able to see those two colors differently, those are terrible choices to use for a map. So then, you know, we use alternate color schemes for that, you know, Color Brewer is a great resource online, colorbrewer.org that has a lot of uh, various color palettes and there's a cool little checkbox. You can just click the box and it will restrict the, um, the color palettes to those that are colorblind friendly. Um, you know, that, and that's one easy way to get at sort of those accessible color palettes. We make our own a number of times, but it, it just goes, you know, back to thinking about those things in a way that a scientist who's focused specifically on, mm. well, why is this area dry? What, how does this compare to some period of time back in, you know, they're not thinking about the color issues and it's important to sort of bring their expertise into our group who thinks about those. And then we can share that science in the best, most accessible way. Do you also share the, the findings on that? Cause I'm guessing like this could be a whole, an entire field of study about like this color palette is a lot easier to understand uh, than this one. And I don't know, maybe this font is a lot easier to read than that one or this one loads faster on lower internet than that one. So it's accessible to people who have lower internet. I don't know. I'm, I'm just making stuff up at this point. I don't know, but I'm guessing this is like a huge field as well. Do, do you share that or do you work with other researchers who do that? 
So we, we don't necessarily do like research. We're not running studies on different color palettes. So we'll follow the science that exists. Like you said, mm -hmm. it's a very deep field, very, you know, very uh, prolific field. There's a lot of science coming out about all those things, whether it's color, whether it's is a bar chart better than a line graph, do you use stack bars? You know, visualization has a very rich history and it's, it, you know, it's growing all the time. So we try to stay uh, stay abreast of that and keep keep things in mind um, when, when we're producing our own graphics. And but do you do you like um, publish some of the findings specifically for like Earth data? Because I think a lot of the the work that you're doing is is a, a reference for not just NASA data, but ESA has a lot of data as well. There's in Indian agencies, like there's there's a lot of agencies, there's a lot of earth data more and more in the world today. Is is that also something that you're sharing for other people who are interested in, in doing that specifically for um, earth observation data? So we occasionally do like blogs and things, but when mm -hmm. it comes to like the, the science of visualization and, and things like that, we're really standing on the shoulders of giants and, right. and using what others are doing, you know, like Cindy Brewer, she's been studying color and, and maps and cartography for decades, you know, so, you know, we rely on, you know, the work that she's done, the work that others done, you know, following, you know, folks like Albert Ocaro, who are writing books about visualization and, you know, thinking about all these things in a very complex way and just keeping all that information in mind and just trying to keep up with it, you know, and I think that separates a lot of uh, groups with earth science, especially where, you know, folks are just looking, well, how can we make this next uh, satellite constellation a little larger? How can we collect more data? Well, how can we share that with readers in a way that they can actually understand it best? Right. Yeah. Well, let's, let's take a little tangent as well on, on, on data formats. This is maybe on the more technical side, but this is something I know you've been a little bit vocal about as well. This is more on the, on the data, on the metadata side of things. Why is, um, why are some formats better than others as well? Like it feels like that shouldn't matter on the visualization aspect in the, in the very end. I'm a little bit in playing sense, devil's advocate here. <laughs> yeah. In a sense, it, it shouldn't matter, um, for visualization where it matters often is for storage or the kind of data that's being represented. So if I, I know where you're going with this <laughs> and I, I see what you're setting up. Yeah. Let's, but, let's be a bit more clear for people who might not, uh, not, not be following. So we're talking about like there, there's, multiple conflicting data formats at the moment for a lot of earth observation data. Um, and there's things like geo tiffs, which is just a tiff, but with geo data, there's net CDF, which is, I think historically more for meteorological, uh, data. Um, and I think maybe you can uh, expand a little bit on that. Yeah. So a great, that's, that's a perfect example. It's like, why even bother with something like a net CDF when geo tiffs exist? and vice versa. Geotiffs are great, especially when you have, you know, just a couple variables, you know, maybe two or three variables that you're looking at. Maybe it's color from Landsat uh, imagery. Maybe it's, um, you know, something like sea surface height at a few different times. A geotiff is great for that. Where a geotiff is not so great is when you have dozens of different variables. Perhaps you have those variables collected at different times. So you have maybe, you know, you could think of uh, water temperatures, right? You might have water temperatures at the surface at hundred meters below 200 meters below. And then you have all those data every day of the year, you know, for several years back, a geotiff simply cannot store data that way. So you're left with the question, okay, do I want to store thousands of geotiffs or maybe there's another format that would allow me to save the same amount of data and maybe a dozen of them. And that's where a lot of these data distribution centers, prefer net CDF because they can store far more data and a convenient, you know, individual file rather than constantly having APIs, researchers, and, and others just pinging their servers, downloading, you know, thousands of geotiffs when it can just be, you know, a couple net CDFs. The other aspect of that is not all data is two dimensionally spatial. So it's not all just lat lawn and some third variable that you're going to map out over a grid. Maybe you have something like Calypso, which takes a radar profile as it orbits. So then you have this, you know, this curtain where again, a geotiff would be useless for that. So that's where something like a net CDF comes in where you can access, you know, that information and any kind of way that you want to, you can read the dimensions, 
vertically, you can read them horizontally. The other aspect of that is that scientific data don't just come, you know, as a geotip and that's it. Like there's all kinds of other variables in there, you know, the azimuth of the sun, might be the angle of the space track, the, the orbit height, all kinds of things go into that. And science users are going to make use of all of those in a way that the general public might not use them or might not even want to use them. But making sure that all that data is in there is key for something like NetCDF so that, you know, the, the, the science users can produce what they need to do, do the analysis that they need to do. And oftentimes a geotiff might result from that, but it can never be the starting point when you have data as complex and as, you know, multivariate as uh, often earth science data is. Are you working with uh, the the teams that might be creating the, the data and, and putting it, packaging it in a format like to provide that feedback back to them to be like, hey, as like end you or some end users of the data, this is this is what makes our job a lot easier on using this format instead of this one or this standard instead of that one. I mean, we certainly have, you know, some interactions with the science teams and the, the data centers, but it's not, you know, in any official capacity. Right. And it's certainly not one that I personally would advocate for changing. You know, it works great. And that mm -hmm. CDF is awesome. You know, I, I know a lot of people get upset about it, but I'm, I'm thoroughly 100% convinced that the people upset about it are either not thinking about, you know, data users beyond their own circumstances, you know, like how might others be making use of this data? And, and another thing that I see, and this is a bit of a tangent, but I see it all the time is that when people complain about NetCDF, it's always, this isn't a geotiff. It's not ready to go in the way I need it. I very rarely see someone say, oh, this isn't a geotiff, but I'm going to try to make it work anyway. I'm going to try to, you know, read this data. I'm going to try to go through this tutorial. I'm stuck on step three. Can someone help me? And that's where my gears really start to get ground is because it's never someone asking for help. It's just someone asking for data. And there, there's a sort of a personal entitlement that comes with that, that no matter whether it's NetCDF or anything, it's more likely that you get the help that you need when you've shown you've at least tried, mm -hmm. you've put some effort into the thing, you've got some skin in the game and you have a genuine interest in trying to solve the problem rather than just ensuring that somebody else already meets your needs. Is that part of actually the, this is one of the things I wanted to talk about on, on uh, exploring teaching. Is that something that you've done uh, or are doing either at NASA Earth currently or just on the side or something that you've explored? Because it feels like the, the team that you're part of probably has a lot of really interesting skills and probably a lot of people want to know and learn how to do that. Yeah, so... I mean, part of that comes from, you know, my background, like I did start out teaching cart cartography labs and things like that. So, you know, when a student runs into a problem, it's helpful to, you know, lead them through the solution, you know, step by step. Mm. So, you know, that, that's just sort of like a background of why I like to see people at least try, like try to solve the problem. And then, you know, we, we can certainly help you get to the result, but you need to understand why your particular desired end product might not be the global, you know, best for everyone. The other thing too to mention is that the, the NASA Earth Data Group in particular puts out tutorials and things like that, like how to access, how to find data, how to use it in QGIS and other things like that. So there, there's so many resources out there that would help people, you know, use this data, how to find it. And it's just a, a wealth of information that already exists. Right. No, that, that's hard. That makes a lot of sense. I want to go a little bit into the uh, into like what it looks like, how you guys actually work. What are some of the the tools, for example, or the methods that that you use? When again, let's let's go back to this uh, story of of the power outages. What are some of the tools that that you use to make some of the visualizations and, and tell some of the stories from the data that that you have? Sure. And the, the hurricane example might not be the best one because the analysis team puts together some pretty clean oh, okay. uh, geotiffs for that, <laughs> that we just overlay with like open street map and other data. Um, a great one would be, you know, maybe um, just hurricanes in general okay. when we want to show like wind speeds. So for instance, that comes as net CDF data, but we have um, 
I, I will just mention that those particular NetCDFs, if you try to open them in QJS, they, they just work. You know, the, the NetCDF conventions are well built into that format. So it has the understanding of latitude and longitude. You just select your variable and it works. But, you know, for instance, if we want to show wind speeds, we have um, essentially a GDAL workflow set up where we can read those data out, produce geotiffs, and then apply color palettes. And essentially, we end up with a, a colored RGB image that we then throw back into to QGIS for like borders and, you know, maybe look at different projections, add some different layers if they're necessary and, and things like that. But so is that that that's like that sounds like quite some custom tooling that you've built around like QGIS, DDL, all these open source uh, tools on top of it. Yeah, so we, we do have some custom workflows and pipelines. Um, they're not terribly complex. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things, you know, since we're working on daily deadlines, there's only eight of us and our group in, entirely, and that, you know, includes writers. Um, so not everyone's, you know, touching the, the data itself. So we have to keep everything very lean. So, the, you know, the, the kind of scripts and the tooling that we're writing are very, very quick, very small, very minimal just getting us from that raw data to a workable product as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Do you use some tools that are like not geospatial at all? Like something like Photoshop? Uh, I mean, that's the biggest one. Yeah, absolutely. Every image that we produce goes through Photoshop for like annotations and scale bars. So one of the things that all Earth Observatory uh, images, except those from like the ISS that might be at like a weird angle or something, but any map or, or image has a scale bar and a north arrow on it. And that all okay. happens in Photoshop. So that, that's one area where we do have a very customized script. So we have a little plugin for Photoshop where you can tell it, you know, the image resolution, how, how wide the crop is and so on. And it does all the math and then automatically inserts our assets for the correct font for the scale bar, the correct size of the scale bar and the, the particular North arrow graphic. Right. Yeah. That's, I think that's one of the things I've, I've learned is like, oh, there's a lot of tools that are used that just, even if it is geospatial data, you don't need geospatial stuff necessarily. You can get a lot of stuff done without it. Um, there's a lot of people Absolutely. who do really cool stuff without ever having heard what QGIS is about, and, and they make really cool maps. Yeah, absolutely. And there's being more and more of that, you know, all the time. And like like we were talking about earlier, these people bringing new pers perspectives to to maps and, and graphics. That that's often where it happens that, you know, it's not going to happen by someone that already knows QGIS, for, for instance. I want to take maybe a, a bit of a stretch, but I wonder if um, you've seen a change or, or you are thinking of a change of, of how people consume information and data. Like a lot more things can be dynamic today with you know, the internet, with access to um, pretty good um yeah cellular data as well so on the go you have you have you, you can pull data you have smartphones which are incredibly powerful where we don't necessarily need to have a static piece of information come in where you get an article you get an image but you can have something that you can scroll through you can zoom in and zoom out where you might have a little bit less control as to how the person is going to experience it like through a dashboard or a, an interactive map, something like that. Is that something that you're thinking uh, about as well? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I think often just gets taken for granted is just how sophisticated the modern reader is when they come to an article. You know, the types of charts they encounter daily, the types of maps and graphics, the variables that they're seeing. You know, it, it's not uncommon somebody opens the New York Times today that they're going to see a map of like, you know, pollutant levels or sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. You know, I think that's different than it was just 10 years ago and certainly different than it was 30 years ago where, you know, maybe a bar chart or something very simple enters the news, but now you've got these very sophisticated gra graphics. You know, I, I think of, for instance, um, you know, like the group at the Financial Times, they're, they're putting out great climate graphics, very sophisticated uh, maps, you know, things like Russia and the Ukraine uh, situation and very detailed maps and, and just combining things in a way that are so sophisticated and it's so easy to take for granted, you know, the, the level and the, the expertise that goes into these things, but also just how easily, you know, folks are reading them now. People have a hunger and almost a demand for these complicated graphics because that is now the norm.
Right. So th- that's that's on the depth of information that you can show to someone. Like you don't need to summarize it more. You can show more. Like if if you're showing like uh, I think you said carbon dioxide. Like those are pretty technical, pretty complex information to show, and that's something that you're seeing more and more. Yeah, people see. There, you know, there's more nuance. There's more subtlety with right. with you know what people are seeing. How does that change the way that you communicate then? Sure. So it, if you look at, you know, at a timeline of Earth Observatory graphics, you know, you know, you can pick one graphic every five years going back, you can see that there's this shift towards more complexity, more sophistication, more annotations, more, um, you know, multiple layers of data and information. You know, before it might be like, you know, here is where the rain fell. And now it's like, here's where the rain fell. This is why this is where it's going. This is where that mm. storm is going. Here's how the winds contributed to that. Here's how the terrain block, you know, there, there's so much more information that a map isn't just this little bite sized thing to break up the text. It's now this whole story of its own guiding readers through a situation. Right, right, right. I understand. It sounds like it's also a lot more work to, to, to make something like that. It, it is. And, and, some ways it isn't, you know, if you think about like what it would take to make a rainfall map 10 years ago or 15 years Fair ago, enough. simply getting the data and putting that on there would be a great ordeal. Now, you know, we can run a script and we have that information in seconds. So then we can spend more time with those annotations, diving deeper with the, the multi-levels of d- data that we could get. Right, right. So the, the work is changing uh, as well, rather than just getting more complicated because you can mm-hmm. automate things and things are getting a lot simpler. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's easier to work with, so we can now do more with it. Yeah. On on a similar note, I read a um, written interview that you did. And one of the things you mentioned is uh, you were pretty excited that you've had the opportunity to, and I'm paraphrasing, to, to work with um, like ingesting some of the data in, in movies and in some of like filmmaking, things like that. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly if I got that right, but does... Could you, do you could you elaborate a little bit on that, on on some of sure, the examples I'm, of when that happened? I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm having trouble drawing back to that quote, but I mean, uh, maybe it's me that. Uh... <laughs> one of the things you know, often Earth Observatory graphics and animations are used. You know, sometimes I think it was one of the, the Thor movies where there's a credit to NASA Earth Observatory at the end. Um, you know, the black marble imagery of night lights in particular that gets used often. Uh, that was most recently used as part of the Super Bowl halftime show. So they had like this Earth at night, and you just sort of zooming in, and eventually wind up, you know, at the Super Bowl. But some of our graphics were used in that animation, and that stuff is always awesome to see that kind of thing. Are you working with them, or is it just they have just people doing it and they credit it yeah, at the end? Th- that's all, you know, third party stuff, and that just goes to show, like, like I was saying earlier, when we put out a, a graphic, we have no idea how it's going to get mm. used. You know, years later, we put out that imagery in 2016, and then now in 2022, it's part of a halftime show. Like, there's no way to ever predict that. Yeah, that's that's probably pretty. And I'm guessing like you just are watching the Super Bowl, and then you're like, oh, this is a thing we made a while ago, and completely randomly it shows up. Yeah, we had no idea that was coming, and just watching the Super Bowl like anyone anyone else, and like, hey, that that looks awful familiar. I know those pictures. <laughs> Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I gotta say that 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 sounds like a pretty nice perk of the job as well. Um, yeah, I I do want to uh, just come back again to this notion of like this this dynamic offering of of, of data. Like we're seeing more and more um, things where people can interact with that. And I just wanted to 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 come back to to if that has if that's something that you've uh, interacted with. So one of the ex- examples that comes to mind is, for example, we've seen um, dashboards of, of COVID, for example, when um, like the, the John Hopkins map, I think, uh, of the number of cases. Um, so that's not directly like Earth data, but I'm just thinking about this because maybe a sure. lot of people are familiar with that. So it's this dashboard, but you can you can tweak a lot of things. You can toggle a lot of things on and off. And that just means that the information that you're seeing changes a lot depending on what you're doing compared to here's three graphics that are showing three different things. It's here's a tool that then the user, the reader can go in and play around with and, and put things in and out. And there's a 
way more combinations than you could have done with just a few graphics. Is that something that uh, you're working on, working with and, and thinking about? So our particular group doesn't put out too many like interactives or, or things like that because we're working on daily deadlines. We publish a story every single day. We don't have the resources to like, you know, sink into this huge interactive dashboard. But groups like climate.gov, for instance, they have, you know, dashboard like figures and, and things that are automatically updating, you know, whether it's like the current climate dioxide levels. Um, NSI, NSIDC has like a dashboard for sea ice. So you can see different sea ice metrics and melting and, you know, what's Greenland look like today, that sort of thing. And it's just great to see how data is contributing to that. I know, you know, there are people out there that have a lot of negative opinions about dashboards and, you know, there, there's fair room for critique about them, but at the end of the day, people do sort of like to get this overall sense, like, you know, what's the heartbeat of the situation? And then that can trigger, you know, more analysis later on, you know, these public dashboards, you know, that's not necessarily the thing an analyst who has raw access to the data is using to make important decisions. That's helping the public and get a broader sense of, you know, multiple different things happening all at the same time. Do you have advice for people who are wanting to get into this or people who are more on the science or engineering computer science aspect who might work with it with, with some of the data we're talking about, but might not be very good at telling stories or, or showing it to people like where, where do you think people could get started? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I think it's one of those things that just changes all the time. You know, like if, if you want to work in, in journalism, you know, having a journalism background, taking some journalism courses, you know, that's obviously going to be a very good thing. Um, working with earth science data, you don't have to be a programmer. You know, you don't have to write Python scripts to read HDF files to do this kind of thing. You know, there are geotiffs out there. There are shape files like you can, you know, even get JPEGs of, you know, various satellite images and you, you can start using that. You know, we get questions from artists sometimes who are building these big giant murals and they just want a JPEG of, you know, some ice cap or something. And they're going to turn it into this super cool painting or do something really creative with it that would never enter the mind of a scientist. But no matter what your background, if you have an interest in this thing, there is, I guarantee you, a way to, you know, contribute, to be useful to, to, you know, satisfy your own desires and passions through this, you know, through earth data and, and earth science. So just get started, basically. Yeah, just do it. Roll up your sleeves, you know, ask how you can get something and the community at large is, in general is very helpful. Do you, um, talking about that, did, did you have like, uh, recommendations of, of places where to meet other people, like communities, like where, where can people find that, those communities? Sure. And the first community and the best one that comes to mind is NASIS. So that's the North American, uh, cartographic information society. They publish the, the journal cartographic perspectives. So there's a peer reviewed journal with all kinds of, you know, neat cartographic critiques, uh, new techniques, things like that. But there's also an annual meeting where everybody comes together, shares the research, shares the things that are going on and just meets like-minded folks who are, are making maps and just having a real fun time doing it. And that's, especially if you're uh, in North America, NASIS is, it's a must. Like you, you should have to be a, a NASIS member. Um, they didn't pay me to say that, but if I'm going to plug a group, <laughs> I, I will plug NASIS, you know, so hard that they're, they're awesome. Do you have any online resources as well for folks who might not have access to that? Well, that's a great thing. Cartographic perspectives is available for everyone. So, okay. you know, they, they can read that, but you know, like there's the ICA, their international, international cartographic association. Um, there are various groups like that. Um, there's just different bloggers too, that are putting out information. Like, you know, I have a blog where I share some stuff about mm -hmm. how to read net CDFs, how to make nighttime images. Rob S Simon has some great blog posts on GDAL. Um, even at the earth observatory, um, when Rob Simon was at the, uh, earth observatory, he ran this blog called elegant figures. And there's a lot of cool tutorials in there, um, with Landsat, how, how to use color effectively and things like that. What, uh, I, I wanted to touch on that a little bit as well. Like what, what prompts you to, to write and to have a blog? Like, as I can imagine, it's a lot of time invested as well. Sure. And, and I would say mine's probably 
neglected a bit. You know, I, I don't put as much effort into it as I should, but I do think, you know, a blog and having some online presence is very helpful, especially if you're just getting started out in your career, no matter what career, even if you plan to be a dentist or something, you know, if you have an online presence, people know you, you're sharing stuff, showing others that you care about this thing, you know, a little bit about it, you know, that goes a long way. And, you know, as you learn more about something, you realize, Hey, I didn't know this. And I wish somebody would have told me this. That's a great reason to have a blog because you can be that somebody that tells others, you know, here's how you do this thing, or here's how to think about this thing. You know, if you hadn't considered it this way. Yeah. I think, back to you you put stuff out you cannot imagine or know or even control who's going to read it and how that's going to impact them and, and kind of where that's going to lead them i mean your blog might not end up in the super bowl but it's probably still going to be useful yeah someone will find it useful you know definitely do you have a do, do you, you you've done a lot of visualization you've probably seen a lot of them as well does off the top of the, your head, like, is there one or two, like, visualizations that you've seen throughout your whole career where you've been like, wow, this is really, really well done? Sure. So the, I, I would say the first would, would be just a whole body of works. And that's from Tom Patterson, a cartographer with the National Park Service, who just makes beautiful maps. And not only are his maps like incredible, incredibly beautiful and, and detailed, he shares his techniques for how he made those. And a lot of that stuff is just, you know, Photoshop, you know, back years ago, you know, Photoshop could, you know, do all kinds of things, you know, just like, you know, make hill shades and, and do things like that. And, and Tom shares a lot of resources that can sort of help bridge that gap from going from someone who does something in Photoshop to more complicated things in GDAL. But if you're just getting started, Tom Patterson's blog is a great way to, you know, fall in love with maps and then see how to make them. And, and do you have any visualization in, in particular? Otherwise that comes to mind. I mean, he's got like, I just think of Tom Patterson's maps. It's just like a okay. matrix of so many beautiful things like Glacier Bay. Um, he's got some great maps like terrain shading and, and, you know, shade of relief. His work is just. I don't know. I'm just a huge fan of Tom's work always have been. And it, it's just, it's great. Cause you know, there's so many greats in cartography, like Edward Imhoff who made great relief maps, but they're not making them anymore. Tom keeps making, you know, ma keeps making maps. And it's cool to see someone you look up to actually improve too. I'm oh, sorry about that to actually improve. And then you can, you know, see that basically everyone's going through the, the same process. We're all getting better. We're all learning and if you make something put out there, people will enjoy it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And I'm sure like sometimes he doesn't know how people are, are receiving his work. Probably. I mean, he is a very successful cartographer, but he's a very humble, humble man. Yeah. I, I do like running these conversations off, like asking about um, books or an podcast uh, recommendation. The reason I do that is because they're pretty hard to uh, find sometimes. Um, they, they, travel a lot through word of mouth and i think they tell a little bit about people as well so is there uh let's say one book and one podcast that that comes to mind not necessarily about cartography or, or anything that we've talked about but that you think would be worth uh, sharing and people taking a look or listen i mean i think one of the earliest uh podcasts that i started listening to a lot was just radio lab and the, the variety of topics they're talking about and you know one day you're learning about mantis shrimp and the next day it's about some dna uh, technology and just being exposed to so much different science at a very, um, very low, uh, easy to understand kind of level that just made it really accessible and fun. So radio lab. Yep. Okay. From, uh, the, yeah. And, uh, in, uh, on books is do I don't know if you read a lot. Is there anything that comes to mind? So I, I don't read a lot of, of, you know, fiction these days. I, I wish I had more time for books. But, you know, relevant to the topic, you know, thematic cartography and visualization is a great book. You know, having a total mind blank on the, on the author at this point. That's all right. I'll but find that. that. Yeah, that, that's a book that, you know, I flip to all the time because it's got so many great examples. It's this timeless uh, information that that's really helpful. Great. Yeah, I'll put all of the all of that and, and some of the things that we talked about in the show notes uh, so, so people can find them uh, a little bit easier. 
Joshua, thank you very much. Uh, this was great. I'm also glad that we finally made it happen. Yeah, it was a long time coming. and I'm glad it worked. It was great talking with you. Yeah, thanks for sharing uh, some of that. I, As I said, I work uh, also in the private sector, but I don't, uh, I do a lot of the processing. I don't really spend that much time on making the maps, even though the podcast is, has maps in, in, in the name. So this was great to dive a little bit deeper into behind the curtain of how we make some of those really cool visualizations. Thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, spending some of your valuable time with me. Yeah, it was fun. 